Welcome everyone. My name is Maureen Antunes, president of the Spark City Society, and I'm very pleased to be here today to welcome you to our first webinar of 2022, From Another World, the VFX of Resident Alien with the COSA VFX team. Um, so we're going to start in just a moment, but before we do, I wanted to take a, a quick moment to thank our sponsors who make these events possible. Our Terabyte sponsor, Creative BC, supported by the province of British Columbia. Our Megabyte sponsors, Animal Logic, Capilano University, and AMPD. Our Kilobyte sponsors, Atomic Cartoons, Braun, Sony Pictures Image Works, and Mainframe Studios. Our Byte sponsors, the Center for Digital Media, Versatile Media, Little Dev Shop, and DigiBC, and our partner, ACM SIGGRAPH. We're going to start today's webinar with a short presentation. It's approximately 20 minutes long. And after that, we're going to come back and our panelists are going to answer some questions for you live. So if you have questions, I urge you to pop them into the Q&A section of the webinar, and then we can answer, we can, we can have our panelists to answer those right after the video plays. So here we go. Enjoy this presentation and we'll see you in about 20 minutes. I got the rock star parking everybody wants Out on the street, 40 feet from the bus stop Cause every day and every night I'm slamming the bubbly Diet Coke from the stud down on the corner block Hi everyone, good evening. Thank you for joining us for this special presentation of Behind the VFX of Resident Alien with our friends here at Spark CG. Before we begin, we'd also like to say thank you to our partners at NBC Universal for making this possible. Without further ado, here's the Cosa VFX resident alien theme to show you things from another world. Um, first off, um, can you introduce yourself and say what your role was on the Resident Alien team? I'm Jose de la Puente and I was the visual effects producer. I'm Brian Fisher and I was the on-set visual effects supervisor. I'm David Deaton and I'm the visual effects supervisor. I'm Adam Benson and I was the CG supervisor. Uh, Roger Vizard and uh, anim senior animator on the project. Now, there was a lot of emphasis to give the prosthetic creature more expression and realism through visual effects. Can you elaborate on what we did with that? Um, yeah, every time Alan's in a, uh, we see him in the alien costume, um, he's unable to really emote facially. So um, through compositing techniques, we gave him extra expressions with his eyes and his brow and his mouth to, uh, to help uh, give the scene more life, more reality. Um, so it was uh, kind of our bread and butter on the show. We did a lot of them um, and they turned out to be quite successful. Can you talk about the transformation from the alien into human in the first episode? Um, for a lot of that, we had two different models, a human model and an alien model. And we had to match move both of those to the live action plate and then um, we used a bunch of uh, Houdini effects to kind of blend between the two. And then once we had our bubbles that moved across the creature, we handed that off to Brian's team and they did the final kind of blending together, accentuating that, making that look more realistic than what we were able to do purely out of CG. Can you talk about the spaceship and the subsequent crash and what went into creating that? Well, the uh, spaceship and the crash, of course, you know, uh, modeling ships and things, there's nothing really new to CG. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges that we faced with that was getting it to look like it was in a storm. A lot of the storm work we did was actually done in comp. Um, and then apart from that, getting it to interact with snow, uh, have that feel realistic um, and feel like it was part of a, a natural world. You know, we had everything from trees to snow banks to smoke elements to ice elements that we had to put together into that. Um, there was fire elements that we had to put in there as well, interacting with the snow because when that fire hits the snow, it behaves differently than it was when it was flying through the air. 
uh, there was there was actually a, quite a lot of work that went into that crash sequence. Uh, just to add a little bit, uh, we had a little bit of a exciting challenge because we were given a lot of creative freedom to, hey, you can rough out whatever you want to say here, but at the same time, that little scene is crucial for the whole season because there is very important story points. We lose the device, we lose the bomb, where do the pieces of the spaceship fall and when do they fall? So it was a very exciting challenge to have the creative freedom to make it look as cool as possible, but at the same time hitting the narrative beats that the showrunners needed us to, to hit. So it was quite exciting to work on that. And something that I make everybody get tired of hearing is I was also after making sure our camera movements were more cinematic. They were the kinds of camera operating we would see from um, real life operators as opposed to, you know, a CG that's, we just tracked the center line of it or whatever. It's like ways to make it feel like there were cameras on, you think of it as this camera's on a dolly, what's happening when it happens, this camera's on a crane, what happens when it happens, those types of thought processes to, to make sure that the language of the scene was the same language in our film. Yeah, one, one thing that David mentioned a lot of times, and I think it, it made it that extra level of realism is, for example, one trick that we usually go for in visual effects is camera shake. If there is turbulence, add a camera shake. But at the same time, when you're filming a spaceship in the sky, what is shaking? There's nothing shaking there other than the spaceship itself. So it was pointless to add camera shake. And when we started taking out those extra layers, we felt that it was way more grounded, way more real. So it was, it was very good. Can you talk about the animation of the alien in general? Yeah, and I got to say that this is beyond, I mean, I've worked on a lot of great, uh, you know, features and episodics. This is by far one of the more funnest and, and, and challenging characters in a way that, you know, he's he's so layered. There's so many layers to the character and, and we have to, um, you know, we crash lands on Earth. Everything is new to him. And, and that was fun. That was fun to explore. Uh, as he's as he's discovering what he's finding on Earth, he, he's discovering, um, you know, what he needs to do, what he needs to survive. Uh, so these these beautiful little layers that uh, that transcend beyond uh, him becoming a, him an alien and then him practicing being a human being, and and that has to uh, uh, both of them have to work. The alien has to work and the human being has to work, and it was uh, it was a lovely character to uh, to put together and. Um, and Alec Tudyk is he's no easy uh, person to mimic. He's very specific with his uh, acting. He's very, he's very specific with his uh, mannerisms. And we try to get a little of that in the alien. Uh, so it, may, it made it a little easier for us to kind of, um, you know, do the alien, uh, looking at Alan's performance and, the, and then uh, infusing some of that in the animation. Talk about the sequence of Harry riding the horse. Uh, that was tricky. <laughs> that was that was tricky, and and we we've done a couple, done a couple uh, versions of it. I couldn't get out of my head like fistful of dollars, and and uh, you know just when I saw him riding the horse, Ido uh, Miraconi just kept rolling in my head. You know just the rhythm of the character, and as he, as he's uh, as the horse is carrying him along, uh, I you know. Uh, we did everything not to put a poncho on him, on him you know <laughs> it's just uh, something about that moment that that it was just uh, i i heard music when i when i when i uh, an animated that uh, piece uh, mariconi in particular there was just a rhythm uh, and and again you can't you could you could you know when he when he's shooing the flies and stuff like that i mean this is all part of him discovering uh you know what um he he needs to do to survive um and he's uh, uh, he's grown on me a lot. He's grown on me. A, a, I want to ride horses now. <laughs> I think that that chewing of the fly thing is kind of goes back to what Jose was saying too. We've had a lot of freedom for yeah. coming up with what we can do with the character. Uh, in that horse sequence, he shoots the flies. He's kind of got that attitude, you know, of I'm, I'm a Clint Eastwood on a horse kind of thing. Um, when he first comes into the room after throwing Alan out the window. He takes his little hands and does, does that to him, you know, kind of stuff. So we, we kind of, and, and those were all ideas that we just in the room were kind of like, 
how can we make this character more lived in and, and, and more real? And those were all things that were inspired by the creativity in this room. So. One of the things that I really liked about the horse sequence was when he's coming over the hill and he's got the hat and he's looking cool. And right at that moment, the hat blows off and he's like, got to catch it again to maintain that cool. And it was just such a simple beat, but it was, I felt, I felt that gave him a more realistic yeah, and we could have had him just we could have had him just riding on a horse, but we decided let's let's take some of this let's take this opportunity to get that gust of wind, being bothered by the flies. We play we toyed with other things to to keep him interesting and develop the character. It's not just a guy riding on a horse or an alien riding on a horse. It's someone learning as he's going along. So we just tried to dot those little eyes while we could. What are the biggest challenges in creating visual effects for a series like Resident Alien? On that note. Generally, the first challenge is actually understanding what it is that's been written and turning that into something that we can understand that we can make. Um, and that goes through the, the creative process of talking with writers and producers and directors and getting that vision figured out. And from there, then it's a matter of they turn to us and say, well, what do we need to get while we're shooting? Uh, and generally, hopefully, between all of us, we kind of made sure, made sure that we have the things we need. and. We get on set and and ask for what we can get there's always surprises and there's things that sometimes we don't aren't able to get and as long as we have someone like brian who can basically say we can still work with what we have so far then we're off and running and we keep going another challenge that's come in the last five to ten years has been the evolution of netflix and amazon and 4k uh, and the expectation of of uh film quality visual effects and um you know at a fraction of the time and budget you know so that's that's kind of pushed pushed things to be a tad more difficult you know everyone you know there's lots of money that gets thrown into bigger projects but and everyone sees that on television on netflix on amazon in 4k and that becomes the bar when you know a, a, many smaller shows just don't have the time or budget to do that. We still strive for that, but it's, it's, it's still an ongoing challenge. And for me, uh, I worked in the film industry for almost 20 years before I went, came back into television and um, I still have that bar. So it's been a learning process for me to kind of know when to rein things in. And Jose does a great job of reining me in when um, I keep pushing for more versions. Just to add to that, and thank you, Brian, for for the compliment. It's it's also a comedy and a pretty wild comedy. Meaning, the the writers, the the showrunners, they come from a very comedic background, and every episode has two, three, four new things that we have never seen. You can't expect this to be a show that okay, we've done an episode, we know how it works, let's continue, because then then you have a new creature, a new development a new magic whatever it is and and every episode has something completely new that we have never done and that is also incredibly exciting because we are all pretty seasoned people and we would get bored very quickly if that didn't happen so we appreciate the challenge as i have to say what were some of your most notable shots from the season i have i have one that was terrifying when we saw it which is episode seven the episode that starts with in my opinion, one of the biggest time lapse in history since uh, 2001 Space Odyssey, which is basically telling the whole history of the planet Earth in a minute and minutes. And it's all a full CG shot that I remember when I read it in the script, it's like, okay, in my head, this is gonna swallow the whole budget of the first three seasons. <laughs> and you guys cannot do that because they wanted to tell 60 million of the history of evolution and different um, evolutionary states of different creatures. And, and Brian, as, as David mentioned before, he's like, yeah, I'm not afraid, I can do this. And yeah, he took it on, they find a whole incredibly long camera move and we started adding elements to it. And it was a collaborative effort with the post-production team, showrunners internally for weeks on. It's like, what if we add this creature from the uh, Ordovician? And somebody's like, yeah, I like it, let's add it in. So it was seeing it in, what, eight weeks, making something that for me was completely impossible happen, and that was incredible. I actually really like 
just the subtleties with what Brian does and the guys do with the face uh, and, and emoting, just little things, that that little extra thing that makes it really sing. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, but I'm kind of easily swayed by the volume more than the singular, so. How much did the alien character evolve over the series as it goes into the next season? From season one to season two, every every scenario that the CG alien is in is is you would never imagine it him being in that situation. And I'm not going to give anything away, but we, yeah, we can't spoil season two yet. But are you freaking, yeah. freaking kidding? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there's lots of scenarios that are crudely funny that this alien gets into. Um, that is definitely a challenge for animators because they probably never ever animated a character doing such a thing. <laughs> so you'll you'll uh, have to wait and see in season two. And for some of those, we did have to go back through and do check tech checks and things like that to make sure that the character could do some of those motions. And there was a few that we had to kind of modify for to make sure. And I'll say why, because here's the thing. In truth, what you tend to do, what we all tend to do is we build a model and a rig to do what we expect or think it's going to do in the future. There is no expecting or thinking the alien is going to do what it's doing in the future. So. Yeah, and, and one thing that I feel it's very exciting in this show, and this comes from the showrunner once again, which is usually TV shows that are meant to last for seasons are based on the idea that we play with the stereotype of the characters and the characters needs to stay as they were from the very beginning. This is a show that is exactly the opposite. This is all about an alien learning to be human. So the alien is always different. And that is very, very cool for us because we are part of that evolution. And especially when you have such a legend like Alan Tudyk, I can't think of anybody who can be better at doing weird creatures than him. So being able to be part of that performance along with Alan Tudyk is just phenomenal. It's very, very cool. I'd like to uh, introduce our panelists who are joining us for the Q&A, uh, CG supervisor, Mr. Adam Benson, uh, VFX supervisor, Brian Fisher, VFX supervisor, David B Bidon, VFX producer, Jose de la Puente, and senior and lead animator, Roger Vizard. Thank you all for joining us. Um, if you have questions, we already have some questions in the Q&A. If you have questions, please feel free to drop them in there and we will get to as many as we can. But we're going to start with one that I was curious about. And I was wondering if, you, if Jose and Adam, you all kind of already alluded to this. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that crash landing scene, which is so essential and key to the storytelling that you, you, you mentioned. In um, the overall of the, the, the visual effects you guys did for season one, considering how important that scene was, was there more time allotted to it than to other scenes? You know, if I can take this one, we ended up having a little bit of a benefit from um, the COVID-19 pandemic in the fact that the show went on hiatus. And so during that period of time, we ceased all work, but... When our artists had some downtime, they were able to actually kind of spend a little bit of time doing that. So we artificially got more time to work on that than was allotted because we kind of did it under the radar. But then once the season picked back up, 
suddenly we realized just how much work we had left to do. And it's like, okay, it's a good thing that we had. And I mean, it's not like we were spending months or days on this. It was just whenever an artist had some downtime, they would noodle with something here or there and then go back to other shows that were in house. And so um, <clears throat> technically we did not get more time to do it, but sort of we did. So it kind of gave us a little bit of a, a strange benefit in that in that regard that the show had to go on hiatus. Were there any other uh, scenes or any other aspects of the show that benefited from something <clears throat> like that? Well, the entire pilot was during that time. So we kind of chipped away at everything, uh, like Adam said, when artists had downtime. Um, so to, to make to make the whole episode really shine. So, yeah. Um, one of the things that you guys talked about too is the expressions um, for the alien. Um, and I have a question and there's a question actually in the Q&A from Rochelle and Rochelle asks, um, adding the animation to Harry's face for the alien form, do you ever mo motion capture Mr. Tudek or are there any human references used for the animated expressions and enhancements chosen? Yeah, no, we never do any uh, motion capture of him. Uh, you know, we pr pretty much just base it off of Alan's performance in the show. Uh, either myself or David on set all the time. So we, we get to work with him every day that we're on set and we pick up the nuances of how he acts, his facial expressions, and he's got some unique facial expressions. Um, so we just try and carry that over into the animations. So no, there's, there's no mocap. It's all kind of uh, just reference from his act, general acting um, and how he acts. And then we apply that. So there's no CG involved. It's all done in compositing um, with warps and other techniques to bring him to life. And, and actually tied into that, my question was going to be, because I mean, he is a very big actor. He, you know, very expressive facially and just physically. And I'm curious, was are there any, like, how do you know when you've gone too far? Like, are there moments where you kind of put something in and you've thought, okay, well, maybe this is not really working and you have to like dial it down a bit? Well, with, the, and with these facial expressions in general, um, early on, we kind of went over the top of them. Um, and really, facial expressions are very, very subtle. And even the subtlest motion that you, you know, when, when you're wearing a prosthetic mask, there's no, there's, there's no eye movement. There's no, uh, at least with this one, there's very little expression. So and it, just adding the subtlest little, you know, eyebrow raise or, or the uh, scouring of the brow you know, it's, it's all very subtle things. So in the beginning, yes, we kind of we kind of went over the top of the expressions, but we found pretty quickly that they they weren't real. Uh, so we reined them in quite a bit. Uh, sticking to the alien look, we have another question. Uh, Daria asks, I was wondering about the concept of the alien look. Did you have to develop it along the way or is it something that you received from the client, possibly in the form of concept art or clear guidelines? Well, I mean, he was in makeup for, in the pilot that that was that was a given. So we, we pretty much just matched um, the look of the makeup. Um, as far as the body, and because he's got a very unique body, I, I, I believe most of that came from the comic book and, and the production concept artists uh, on the Resident Alien production side. Um, as David mentioned in the, in the video, it's, it's a character that continues evolving and uh, we can't say anything I wish we could, but it doesn't stop on the first season. It continues to evolve in many different ways. So the fact that there was an original model doesn't mean we dropped it. We continuously go back to that model to re-rig it, to re-look David, to add or modify things based on the storytelling that's happening. And there's a lot of more, more of that coming in the next season too. Yeah, and you guys talk a little bit about that and the fact that it's always evolving and always changing and never quite the same thing. And I expect that that's great and it's challenging, but it, it must be frustrating when you have to keep going back to revisit it. Well, probably more for the guys that rig it than me personally, but yes, I can imagine. Um, but it's it's part of the part of the process, you know? I mean, uh, I, I've worked on other shows too that the same thing happens. You're like, you think you've exhausted what you're going to do to it. The creators come up with a new idea and you're like, that throws everything out that we've done for the last season. Okay, great. Well, we didn't exhaust it. So, you know, I, I would like to say, I'd like to hope that no, they're not finding it completely frustrating that everyone's finding it kind of a, a, an interesting and fun challenge, but. 
yeah, I, I, I wanted to say, yeah, it, it is frustrating, of course, um, and I'm managing the budget, managing the schedule. So, of course, it's not fun when you have to go a couple of steps back. In this particular case, I think it's also quite rewarding because uh, Roger's team, the animation team is outstanding. And every time that there was a change, it was an opportunity to say, OK, what new joke can we bring up? And at the same time, the filmmakers, the showrunners, gave us that freedom, but at the same time, we're loving what Roger and his team were doing. So it's really cool to, to receive back a note, which is, ha ha, I laughed my ass out. Thank you. It's like, okay, that works. Thank you. So, so it was quite rewarding at the same time. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that the show is so great at is it, it has a very physical comedy that you don't really expect from a show like this. But, you know, you guys talked a little bit in the video about that horse riding scene and how, you know, all these little tidbits that went into it to make it a little bit more grounded and more like, um, but it, it's almost more human too. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just the kind of thing that you would expect to happen to like some guy, not an alien. <laughs> Um, and, and I was curious if you could talk a little bit about some other, maybe some other scenes where something like that happened, where you've sort of added in uh, some more personality to, to the alien character. I have a couple of ideas, but they are all pretty naughty. <laughs> I remember the, the <laughs> scene in, in the first season where, uh, well, Roger, if you want to play, but basically we were making the alien uh, drink milk directly from the cow to put it somehow and yeah we came up with this animation for the mini arms kind of kneading like a cat would do and it was absolutely hilarious i, I remember having an animator complaining saying why are you doing this to me i, I am getting grossed out as i am animating type of thing <laughs> so that was quite funny yeah, that, that, that was a nightmare for a lot of people continues to be a nightmare uh you know with, with the alien you know, it's it, it, he's a very, as I spoke before, he's a very layered uh, character. He, this is a character that uh, it, uh, his his fear uh, of being a life form that can destroy an entire planet, uh, also juxtaposed to kind of his fear of being of being a human uh, with vulnerability, uh, being a vulnerable. Uh, you know, he, he's discovering how vulnerable he is being human and showing compassion. Uh, uh, and and that um, you know when we came in and, and started doing the alien, uh, I think I originally was trying to make him like really aggressive, you know, uh, and and we kind of had to you know, like soften it and and then find something else for him to do. But uh, you know he was uh, I was thinking here's an alien that's just supposed to drop a bomb and go back home, and uh, and and not uh, think about it again. Uh, and for him to land on Earth and, and slowly develop into being uh, human and, and showing his capability of, of being human and then fearing it uh, to me was just uh, so much fun. And, and to, to get to carry that over in another uh, episode is going to be, uh, I hope, a, a huge treat uh, for everyone. I think I love the scene where he's he's coming out of the bar and his arrogance and his ignorance are are hitting him right in the face where he's like nobody could tell i was different and it's like oh my goodness no you you didn't nail it at all i mean that's one of the one of the kind of personality traits that he's got is that he's so arrogant but doesn't realize how much he's missing and he's learning that yeah and he's a representative of a planet that we've not We've not met the residents of of his planet, but we, but he represents an entire planet. So we have to describe his species through one character, uh, which again makes it even a little more interesting and a little more fun, uh, and, and way more challenging. <laughs> Well, actually, sort of tied into that, uh, Rachel was asking, "Are you hoping to design or animate different species of aliens in the upcoming seasons?" Ooh, who's going to take that without spoilers? Species? I think we can say we can say we we can hope for that. Yes. Yeah. But I don't know that we can say anything else. Yeah. Very sneaky. Very sneaky. Very um, uh, uh, we have somebody else that's asking for the sequences in the end of the world as we know it. How much of injured Harry was practical prosthetics, and how much was animated? It was kind of a 50-50 split because there was a lot of stuff that was practical prosthetics. And one of the challenges there was matching the CG portions to the prosthetic because it had to be seamless. 
And so there are parts where it is the rubber suit. And for instance, when it's when she's doing the, the procedure on his chest, the chest and the wound are all practical makeup, but the baby arms coming up and grabbing her arm is clearly, you know, CG since Alan doesn't actually have a second set of arms there. But it was a blend of both, even, even to like uh, the face animation. I know Brian's team put a lot of artificial blood and things on that to enhance that. Uh, I know Jose had, uh, had uh, mentioned in the video that when he saw the, the, the 60 second world expansion, he, he kind of had a freak out. And I'm curious, and this ties into a question that Daria has asked. Um, for each of you, what was, when you saw it on the page or when you were working on it, what was the scariest uh, the, or the most challenging, the scariest thing to, to that you saw, you thought, we have to do this, are we going to do this? I can start, and I'm sure everybody will have their, their own because it, it all depends on who you ask. Uh, to me, no doubt the crash, because it wasn't only the time and the quality constraint, because I know the guys in this room and their eyes are high level. The sheer number of dynamics in that scene make that really challenging. Yeah. Um, well, one of the scariest moments for me when seeing what was written and uh, was the, the sequence that Jose mentioned about, you know, the, the time lapse from the early, early parts of the universe going all the way to present time and uh, knowing that the budget wasn't as big as we had hoped. And somehow I, I said that we could do the majority of this in comp. Um, and then I was found myself kind of obligated to do that and follow through. So shortly after those words came out of my mouth, I said, Oh, my God, what did I just say? Uh, oh. But uh, luckily, it, it worked out pretty well. <laughs> Originally, there was calls to do whole morphs between multiple creatures and it's like oh my god that's yeah. insane but really i think the lesson learned in this is to never actually say i, I can do it in comp <laughs> turned out okay i think i think it turned out really good i think the scariest thing is the whole darn thing because uh, you know i'm taking <laughs> all, the, all these guys have come up with an idea yeah. from from top to bottom every all these ideas come to uh, one conclusion and I have to, you know, like it, it sounds good on paper, then I have to take it and put it into animation and validate everyone's decision uh, at the end and make everyone happy with it. And, and uh, if, if no one's happy with it, of course, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, a, well, it's a whole bucket of fear, isn't it? <laughs> to that end, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat saddened that you have so much fear but because he really knocks it out of the park on a regular basis so um that, that goes to where my problem probably with the show is i have very little fear about it because i'm looking at a group of people that is going to figure out how to make it work one way or another so i just look at it as like we're gonna do that we're gonna do that what you know so yeah it's oh. good yeah, well, I mentioned I, I come from a 2D background, so we used to hand draw everything. So we, I'd get a stack of like 400 pages of registered paper, and I had to draw and make a, a chunk of paper come to life, uh, and that was very exciting for me. And uh, uh, and it, you know, and it, it is absolutely exciting every time we come up with a sequence, a scene, a joke, uh, a piece of action. Uh, it's it's always exciting, but it's all, but it's also, you know, uh, there's some fear. Here in DC. Yeah, there's got to be a little bit of fear. It keeps you alive. <laughs> uh, talking a little bit about technology, and I know Adam had mentioned Houdini. I'm wondering what tools you guys used to create the show and if there was anything new that was developed specifically for Resident Alien. Most of our work for the animation was done in Maya uh, with the spaceship crash. Houdini was really mostly for our dynamic effects. And then, of course, Nuke for the compositing. I don't think we're, we're not developing any new tools specifically for the show. There's barely time, honestly. I think really what it is is just um, being creative with the tools we have. Well, Brian, didn't you uh, didn't you explore for the uh, space sequence? It seemed like you explored some some newer tech for getting the. 
uh, the galaxy arm and the at the very beginning. Oh yeah, I mean it's I don't know how new it is, but it's some some tools in Nuke called there's a Higax particle system that's a point render was, yeah. based. So it's fairly fairly new, but yeah, that that came into play quite a bit. That actually we use that quite a bit on a lot of different effects on the show, a lot of the energy effects and the alien technology. Uh, we use uh, the uh, Higax uh, point render system. And and to add to that, and of course we can get into specifics, but. All, all the facial enhancements have not a tool set because they are they happen within Nuke, but they have a whole system that allows a, a compositing animators in this case to pick and choose facial poses and morph between them. And all. it's quite fancy. It's quite yeah. Uh, we've we've set up templates for the for all the expressions that you know that make it easier uh, for compositors to pick up tools and gizmos where we you know we we label them like angry or happy or menacing or sad and they could just you know adjust sliders i mean it's not that easy but you know it's we, we try to make it as easy as we can and, and turn key for for anyone who joins the team well and actually you know talking about joining the team i'm curious uh for anyone that's interested in joining the resident alien team what kind of um you know positions do you guys have available what kind of people are you looking for talented artists all the time <laughs> fearless Brave. Yeah. I was gonna say. Fearless, talented artists. <laughs> yeah. I think I think that's key, the, the fearless part, because um, and I think that's something that everybody is enjoying in the show, which is it's very difficult to get bored. It's very difficult to fall in something that happens quite a lot in our industry, which is okay, you are great at doing footprints, you are gonna do footprints until you die. And and here it's pretty much the opposite. There's so much variety of visual effects that it's always something new that we need to R and D and we need to develop and look deaf. So it's it's quite cool that you need yeah you have you need to be able to have a strong skill set somehow of, of variety. For compositors, I always I always ask if they if they do photography or if they enjoy photography because ultimately at the end of the day what we're doing is photography and all the little nuances of what thing make thing, things look photo real are very important, you know? So that's one of the key things I think to have in your arsenal is either doing photography yourself or uh, an enjoyment of the art of it. Don't even get me started on that. How many times have you guys heard me say, what lens is this? What, what, what are we doing? Yeah. And, and, I, and, I, and uh, you know, I, I came from a world of uh, feature, uh, primarily doing a feature before I came to COSA. And uh, everything is, it's, it's quite accelerated, but that's where the talent comes in. They take something, uh, they take something that's episodic and make it feel like a movie, make it feel like a, a rich 35 millimeter, all the experience kind of movie. And that's, and that's something that's amazing with the time constraints and the budget they have to work with. Uh, everyone, uh, you know, just, just is on form uh, and, and, does just amazing, uh, amazing stuff in a short period of time. You know, like uh, you know Brian just taking up arms and just going, "Yeah, I got this. Uh, I I have to do that too." You know, sometimes uh, they'll say, "Hey, is this going to be a bit of a challenge?" Yes, but I got this, and that's what it. That's the personality it it takes to uh, to run it. Yeah, because in, in truth to your question, um, you know, we're looking for every kind of artist. There's there's on display in the show is every discipline that we would have in a house. So there's no, I mean, there's no limit to someone saying, you know, I, I, I'm a comp, or I'm a comp or I'm dynamics, I'm an animator, I'm a rigger, I'm, it, it doesn't really matter because we have all that work to do on just this show. And, that, and that's just this show, whereas a company we've got even more. And, and like when we, were, when we went down, when they were talking about when we went down for COVID on Resident Alien, everybody just pivoted, you know, because so it's not like you're going to run out of shows even so we're you know jose is saying you you, you could be doing footprints for the rest of your life all right not here you're going to be on another show tomorrow if something slows down and and when it comes back you're gonna be doing crazy ass stuff on resident alien so um all the all the disciplines are required and but but i'll stick with um i think i like to think we're a house that really kind of wants and and uh, promotes creativity creative involvement um and 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 then and then fearlessness yeah and, and if i can add because to me it's key and i 
I found a place where it's key to kindness. It's very important for, for Costa Rica. Thanks. It's not only about enjoying your talent, it's enjoying working with you as a person. Um, we have one more question and then we'll we'll start to wrap things up here. Our final question comes from Rachel. For the octopus voiced by Nathan Fillion, is, is any of that practical or was it all animated? The tank itself was practical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's all animated in the first season. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And we can say more. <laughs> and, and I guess to kind of wrap things up, you know, you guys are a, a small part of the team that puts the show together. Sure. I was sure. wondering, you know, any special thanks, any other people that you want to, to mention that have, you know, I mean, the whole team, but. I always feel like I will forget more people than I will properly praise. Um, everybody does such a good job. I'm trying to, I'm, yeah, I, I'm sure. I'm sure you guys have names. Who oh, yeah. Sense. Yeah. We have so many people on the team that are, are endlessly um, necessary and vital to our operation. Um, and I do, I, it's like, if you name names, then somebody's going to feel left out. So it's like, <laughs> yeah. we agree. but at the yeah. same time, I don't want to not give them recognition either. So I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody works their asses off and they're doing a great job of it. So. Oh, yeah. that's awesome. Well, I want to thank you all for your time. This has been enlightening and really fun. Thank you again, Adam, Jose, Brian, Roger, David, and the entire team at COSA. Thank you all so much for joining us and for putting this together. Um, I also want to thank everybody that joined us today. Uh, stay tuned. Season two of Resident Alien launches on the 26th of January, so you can see more of the craziness. Wait, what? More of the 26th of January? Are you serious? Is it that? What? Yeah, yeah, we better yeah. get back. We better get back to work. Back to work. Yeah, it's the first. It's been great. Is the first episode done, Jose? Are we done with that? Are we still... And we start know. and we start cracking season two. We could talk more about it. Yeah, true. Well, well, I think part two of this conversation is going to be coming for sure. So thank you all for joining us. And I want to end by uh, thanking our sponsors again for helping us make this possible. Our Terabyte sponsor, Creative BC, supported by the province of British Columbia. Our Megabyte sponsors, Animal Logic, Caplano University, and AMPD. Our Kilobyte sponsors, Atomic Cartoons, Braun, Sony Pictures Image Works, and Mainframe Studios. Our Byte sponsors, the Center for Digital Media, Versatile Media, the Little Dev Shop, and DigiBC, and our partner, ACM SIGGRAPH. And thank you again to the COSA team. And for everyone, make sure to stop on by sparkcg.org for more great events to come. And we'll see you all at the next one.